Now we will take time to meditate upon God's word. So would you please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 27. Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 27. Follow along as I read through this passage. Matthew 11, verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets, and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he had the devil. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-biber. <clears throat> a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At the time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save or accept the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as he spoke to his disciples and the crowd that came to hear him. My dear friends, what we just read are words of Christ that disturbs every heart, whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian. Not because he wants to trouble you, but because he wants to save you from your troubles. But why is it disturbing to us? Because it exposes the actual condition of every man. Even the man who thinks he is so good that he doesn't need a savior. No matter how religious one may be, no matter whether you think that you are a Christian, the Lord has some strong warning. It's not about what you think. It's about what God thinks of you that ultimately counts. Because all of us have a habit of trying to portray ourselves as 
better than others or quite all right. But God who knows your secrets, God who knows who you are, will judge every man. So what we just read, which we're going to study carefully, God willing, are the words of the great judge of the world. We have judges in our courts. We have judges about judges when they are appointed to Supreme Court. And there are world bodies of tribunal and courts where uh, international quarrels are brought together and then a uh, judgment is made, then the countries have to obey. So there are very high powers of judgment in this world. But even those judges sitting on those thrones will be judged one day. But the greatest judge, and who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now what you are going to hear here is exactly what the judge would one day say. <clears throat> is actually allowing you to have a peep into his verdict. What the verdict would be like. Now, I'm going to take your attention to the very last verse we read, which is verse 47. I mean, sorry, verse 27. Because that verse tells us who Christ is. And it, it actually tells you why he has been saying whatever he has said from verse 16 all the way up to verse 26. And in verse 27, he says about himself, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Now, what is this all things? All things means all things. And particularly in this context, it refers to his authority and role as the judge of the world. Now, one might ask, who are you to make all these judgments? He says, well, let me tell you, God the Father has given me all things to speak of all things. So now, listen, you are listening to the one who is in authority and power, in the sovereign position to make a judgment about you and me. We better tremble in our heart as we listen to this. Listen, what did he say? Now, as we carefully look through this passage of Matthew 11, you see that the first four verses, that is 16, 17, 18, and 19, Explain to us, by means of comparison, the problem of the humanity, and particularly the people of Jesus' time. And that's applicable to us as well, because we are no different. He explaining, by means of comparisons, the problem that will lead to judgment. And this is how he did. Pay attention to verses 16 to 19. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? You know, Jesus was really going through a very, very troubling scenario. There are some unbelieving or not yet believing disciples of John the Baptizer came and asked him, are you the Messiah? Jesus dealt with that. And then, uh, then he also talked about the fact that John the Baptizer was around and, and the people were not really listening to him. Jesus came and before him John the Baptizer came and John the Baptizer was sent to prepare the way for Je uh, Jesus. And at that time, the leaders of Jerusalem, the Jews, they were not happy with John the baptizer. They dealt with him in a violent way. Remember the context? He is in the prison. He was locked up because he told the king Herod that his act of stealing his brother's wife for himself was a sin. So he locked him up. And so the preacher who said the wicked deed of stealing his brother's wife was wrong is in the prison. And the Lord's heart is very troubled. Because the king who is supposed to have proper judgment has no judgment. He puts the righteous man in the prison and he himself is a criminal. is sitting on the judgment seat. Can you see the problem? 
And there is no man to rise up and say, together with John, this is wickedness, this is wickedness. There is no finger pointing at the wicked man. Jesus standing in the midst of such a wicked society asked this question, Whereunto shall I liken this generation? They can't see their adulteries. They can't see the fornications. They cannot see their covetousness. They cannot see the selfishness. What sort of people are these? To what should I liken them? Then Jesus said, well, let me explain this by comparison. Let me tell you what sort of people you are. And he went on to say, It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. You know, in those days when parents go to market, it's not like Singapore. You know, you step out of your house, you get to cold storage or uh, giant or whatever. I'm not advertising anybody, but it is a reality, right? All those shops around your house, you don't have to go very far. I remember in 1980s when I first came to Singapore from India to study. Um, people used to go all the way to Orchard to do the shopping, because that's where all the shopping malls were. But now you have it in every town, right? Every town has shopping centers. You hardly go to Singapore. Orchard Road, very rarely we go. I think I have not gone there for many years <coughs> for any shopping purpose. I might have drove through there many times, but I don't park the car there and walk around. There's no need in these days. Uh, and so we have it all very convenient, but in those days people will go out of their little hamlets or villages and walk long distance to get to a market whether they are selling the sheep or buying a sheep or selling the milk product or going to buy fish or sell fish, they have to go quite a distance. And sometimes parents with the young children would not want to leave the children in the home. They bring them along. <clears throat> and when they reach the market, when they are busy selling and buying, the children will all get together and start playing. Uh, I'm sure they didn't have the playgrounds like ours. You know, or the seesaws and swings and go merry-go-round and all those nicely you know, padded grounds, and our children fall down, we are not scared. Yeah, but in those days, it was just rough and tough, and everybody playing rough, and some children will gang together and call to another group of children, you want to play? You want to play? So they will watch from a distance, and then, then they will say, okay, we are going to whistle, we are going to pipe, and that means you must dance. And if they want to play, and they refuse to dance when they pipe, these people, young children will get angry and say, Oh, you don't want to play. You're not my friends. And they complain. And they maybe even pick a fight. And some others will say, Okay, we play another game. If you don't want to dance, how about we pretend to cry? And it's a funeral situation. The other one was a celebration. Now it's a funeral thing. When we cry, would you also lament with us? And when they don't lament, they accuse them that they are not interested to play. So we have piped unto you, and ye have not danced, we have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. What's the point? Well, Jesus is saying, you are like those little kids who wants everybody to follow them to play the game. And you think, we, the servants of God, came to this world to be entertained by you. You expect John the baptizer to play to your music. You expect me, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to sing your song and dance when you dance and cry when you cry. What are you thinking about us? Are we like those children who go to the market looking for friends to play with? In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, you have not understand who Jesus is, who he is. You take him as a fellow man who has same passions as you are. 
You know, G Jesus Christ didn't come to this wicked world because he thought this world is much better, for, better than the heaven that he was through all eternity. He came to rescue us. He came here to instruct us of our wicked ways. And then having convicted us to call us away to him. He didn't come to sing to your tune. He came to make you sing and dance and walk with him. Not with him coming to you. So Jesus said this after that. Verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And you say he hath a devil. We know John the baptizer. He most of the time was living in the wilderness of Judea. And he preached from there. He called out repent, repent. And when he called out to repent. Well some of them didn't like. Huh, you think we came out from the cities and villages. And come all the way under this hot sun. To be told that we are bad people and we got to repent. Get lost. This guy is demonic, they said. They said, this is a devilish fellow. How in the world he dare come and live and don't eat like us, don't drink like that. And he just live in the wilderness. And I think he's deranged. Maybe in the wilderness he's demon possessed. And that's why he tells us that we are sinners. And ask us to repent. You see, they went to see John so they can sort of get him into their fold and make him to say, oh, we are good people. When John refused to do that, and John said, you must repent, whether it be a priest coming out of the temple or a Pharisee or scribe, when, when Holy Spirit worked in John's heart to tell them to repent, he would do that. He said, repent. And so, when they refused to repent, what did John do? He continued to shout out and say, Repent. Now what happens after that? Jesus comes. Even before John finished his ministry completely, Jesus appeared in the scene. And you see, when John was saying repent, he always said repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. He is talking about Jesus the king arriving. There is no kingdom without the king. So when he said, repent for the king is coming, he's saying that if you don't repent, if you don't look for a savior, you cannot have the king for yourself. So please repent of your sins. But they didn't. And so when Jesus suddenly appeared, what did they say? Verse 19. When the son of man, that's another name for Christ, because he is son of God who became son of man to represent us. So son of man came eating and drinking. Well, Jesus was not like John. John was fasting at times and he was eating just whatever he could find, the minimum that he can find in the wilderness. And the scripture says he was eating wild honey and then he did not look for feast. He was not sitting at feast to be entertained. He was just happy. But now Jesus comes and he goes from town to town. He visits people. He sits with them to eat. Whatever they prepare, he, give, he eats them. And then, you know, they said, verse 19, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine biber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Wow. They tried to find fault with Jesus. Jesus went to the house of the publicans. Publicans are social outcasts of that time. Some of them were tax collectors. Uh, they worked for uh, Roman government. So the Jews were unhappy that these guys are working for the Romans and trying to ex ex exact money out of people, try to squeeze money out of people. And so they were regarded as covetous, not so truthful people. And so they were, they were hated. They were sort of pushed away from society. But when Jesus came, 
He wanted to redeem them. He wanted to save them. Jesus didn't walk away from them. He went straight to them and preached to them. You know, we do know that this particular aspect of Christ's ministry has been uh, sort of distorted by some. There are some preachers of our time who would say, Oh, Jesus went with the, with the sinners and publicans and he started to eating with them and drinking with them and that means Jesus was getting drunk or drinking wine. Maybe not so much of getting drunk but drinking alcohol and all kinds of things. So the, the modern Christians are told it's okay to go to pub, it's okay to go and drink alcohol and you know, it's okay. It's alright, no problem. And they often point to this verse. But what is wrong with it? This is not a proper statement. This is what Jesus is saying that others are accusing him. These are the words of the accusers. And what did they say? They actually said Jesus is gluttonous. So if you take this verse to say it's okay to get, uh, you know, drink wine and alcohol and feel a little bit of the intoxication then you must also say it's okay to be gluttonous because Jesus was accused of being gluttonous and a wine biber. That's a false accusation. Remember, the scripture is against drinking strong drink. Yes, Jesus turned water into wine, but that wine was nowhere, nowhere recorded as alcoholic wine. In the Bible, when you see the word wine, Please remember, it has to be studied in the context. You cannot say every time the word wine comes, it is alcoholic wine. It is not. And the Bible very clearly says, no strong drink. Let me just give you a few examples, okay? Let's go to it right now. Go to Proverbs, please. I know many would laugh it off, but I'm not going to let go so easily. Let's get to this. Proverbs 31. King Lemuel's mother is advising King Lemuel about his life and also his choice of a wife. But I'm not going into that section where she talks about the choice of wife. Let's see what he was told by the mother. Verse 4. Proverbs 31 verse 4. What do you read? It is not for Kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Did you hear that? It is not for kings to drink wine. Nor for princes strong drink. You remember that? I told you. When you see the context, if the wine refers to strong drink, that means intoxicating drink. The word wine can also mean grape juice in the Bible. Non-alcoholic grape juice. But when it is alcoholic, it is called strong drink. And the context shows that. Look there. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law. And pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. What does that mean? We have one more verse to go. But let me ask you. What does it mean? It means if you are going to be the ruler of the country. You cannot afford even for a second to be intoxicated in your mind because you may accidentally pervert the judgment. You may not do the right thing. It's very foolish to be intoxicated. And I've said this before, if I being your pastor and, you know, one day I'm so tired, go home and ask my wife to pour some alcoholic wine and a drink, I say, oh, so nice, give me one more cup. And then after a second cup, I don't know, I never tried this, so... Never tried in my life, so I don't know how many cups will make you go round and round. You know. Let's say the second cup make me, you know, intoxicated. And then I sit there and one of you calls me about 10.30 p.m. Because you are troubled, your heart is uh, really painful, you feel like committing suicide. And you call me, Pastor Koshi, how are you? I'm all right. <laughs> Pastor, I need some counseling. I feel like... Killing myself. It's all right, sister. Go ahead. <laughs> How in the world can I be clear-minded? Do you know even the police tells you don't drink and drive? As you know. 
and that they sell drink. They are now banning cigarettes. Very good. I think they should ban alcohol as well. Why, why all these accidents? Why all the quarrels? It's no fun, my dear friends. It's no fun. The Bible is clear. Now, let me ask you. Jesus is Israel's king. If the Bible says it is not for king to drink wine, strong, strong wine, alcoholic wine, do you think Jesus Christ who came to fulfill the law of God would get drunk or even give alcoholic wine to others? His own word says it's not for kings to drink. Will he then serve wine, strong wine, alcoholic wine to people? Absolutely no. I have no, so many more verses to show you, but no time for today. But, read the next verse in Proverbs 31, verse 6. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. Wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. So some people told me, ah, Pastor Koji, right here. Right here. When I am depressed, I can drink. <laughs> right. If you want to perish... You understand? If you want to perish in your depression, go drink. The Bible never recommends wine as a solution for depressed hearts. Trust in the Lord. Bible never teaches you to be intoxicated. This is saying, if they want to perish, let them go get drunk. It's not advising you to go and give intoxicant drinks to those who are depressed. Now, even if I were to come down and say, okay, I get your point. But then, it is not every man to get drunk and depressed. But if a man is truly out of his mind, maybe as a medication, it can be used. The Bible allows strong wine to be used as a medication. We know Paul recommended that to Timothy because of his ailment in the stomach. But that's only a little wine, not a large cup, you know. A little fine for the ailment. It is very clear. So for a medical reason, for curing an ailment, or even a very depressed and mentally deranged situation, I understand, I accept that. But it is not the norm. This is a cure. And you need to understand that. Okay, so we, that's all the time I have. So I don't think Jesus was ever a wine viber. But then he, what did he do? He ate and drank with them. It doesn't mean he drank alcoholic wine with them. Do you believe he was a glutton? Because somebody accused Jesus as a glutton? You think he was eating and eating and eating? Of course not. It simply says Jesus himself. Listen to what Jesus said about what he did. Pay attention to it. Verse 19, son of man came eating and drinking. He didn't say son of man came being a glutton and a drunkard. That was said by the unbelieving people who accused him. So please get it right. Don't use this verse in the wrong way to defend your wine drinking habits. I mean alcoholic wine, okay? It can be dangerous. I know of a pastor who got drunk. He, he never take care of himself. He pretended he, uh, he didn't drink, but he came out of the house singing some funny songs. And then others in the church saw it. They become so agitated. Because when they try to talk to him, he can't even talk. And he's singing stupid songs of the world. A pastor. I will not tell you who it is and what it is. Don't come and ask, Pastor Koshina, can I check with you? Is that story about so and so? No, you are, I'm not going to tell you. I, I think the man repented, so thank God. But I don't want to be caught in that situation. So if I come and visit you, please don't pour any alcoholic drink into my cup. Don't do it. Spare me, please. And I will scold you if you do that. <laughs> now, Jesus was committed to living a perfect life on earth. He cannot allow anything to make his mind tipsy-topsy. He cannot. And now let's move on. And so Jesus said, well, you call John the baptizer who was fasting and eating the very minimum, a devilish man. And I came 
normally eating and drinking, but you call me a glutton and a wine biber. And a friend of publican and sinners. Jesus was not a friend of publican and sinners in a way that he enjoyed their wickedness. No. He was friendly to a publicans to win them for Christ. To win them away from sin. Jesus never went with publicans and sinners to do the wicked thing. He never did. He only called them out of it. So Christians who go with their ungodly friends and engage in wickedness, whatever wickedness they be, and then say, oh, Jesus did, they are pouring contempt on Christ. Let me say that very clearly. Jesus was a friend of all sorts of people, whether they be prostitutes, whether they be publicans, or whether they be quarrelsome people, whether they be dejected or depressed, rich or poor, whoever comes to him, he will reach out to them, only to win them from their sins, never to join them in their sin. So Jesus' problem was this. You people want me to sing when you want me to sing. When you pipe, you want me to dance. When you mourn, you want me to lament. No, 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 that's not what I did. You get all mixed up in your mind. And then he said at the end of verse 19, but wisdom is justified of her children. What does that mean? Here wisdom is personified as a woman, a mother, having children. Wisdom is justified of her children. Means when God's wisdom, like a mother, comes to you and beckons you and keep telling you what is the right thing to do. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. When the children obey it, the mother's wisdom is always justified in a sense that the mother's wisdom is then praised, acknowledged, and proven to be right. So when Jesus gives you wisdom, you better do not contradict it because you will be proven as unwise children who rejected wise counsels. And now, let's pay attention to this. In verses that follows, verse 20, very quickly, stay with me, to verse 24, Jesus compares and explains their doom. He not only explained by comparison the unbelief and the problem existed, he also explained by comparison their doom. Let's listen to this. Jesus said, he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. You see, Jesus went from place to place doing great miracles, healing the, the blind, causing the lame to walk, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, turning water into wine, walking on the water, stopping the storm. He did such supernatural miracles. People watched it and they came in great, great multitude, big crowd. They watched that. They say, whoa, this is amazing. But Jesus said one thing, they did not repent. Did you notice that? And so, he picks up certain cities. In verse 21, he picked up two cities known as Chorazin and Bethsaida. And then in verse 23, he picks up another one called Capernaum. All these cities are in the northern part of Israel, where much of Christ's miracle works were done. You know, because Jesus often withdrew from the southern part of Israel where Jerusalem and the temple was. That's where the priests and the Pharisees, the religious elite were there. To go there and preach is not always easy. Jesus do go there on occasions to celebrate the feasts, like Passover feast. After that, he would quickly withdraw from Jerusalem and go up north in the Galilee region. That's where much of the Gentiles, like Roman army, and all settled. And Jesus did a lot of work in Galilee area. And these are three of those cities in Galilee region, where Christ has done enormous number, I would dare say countless number of miracles. Thousands and thousands of people were healed. And they were aware of the fact that he is not like any other man. 
But you see, Jesus did not say, they didn't come to me. Jesus didn't say, oh, they didn't uh, appreciate what I did. What Jesus said is this, they repented not. You know, dear brethren, I'm so glad you came to church. And many of you are thankful for many answered prayers. But if you continue in your sin, that's one thing the Lord will be most unhappy with. You may give a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or a million dollars to the church, but the Lord will still be unhappy because He didn't come as a beggar when He piped. Oh, when you pipe, you know, when he says, oh, please help me, and you come. Oh, I dance your song. No. Today, churches are so eager to invite celebrities and famous and rich people into the church and take the photos and put in the website and say, see who came. But the question is, whoever come, did they repent? If they have not repented from their sin, God's wrath is on them. Jesus did not come here to entertain sinners. He came to save sinners from the coming wrath. So Jesus said this. Pay attention to this quickly. Verse 21. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in two ancient cities, Tyre and Sidon, they would, have been, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Tyre and Sidon are two ancient cities which are located on the northern, northwest side of Israel. If you go up Galilee, further up, the western part, the coastal line along the Mediterranean Sea, these were the two fantastically rich, mighty cities, Tyre and Sidon. It was like our Singapore. Very wealthy countries. They were city-states like ours. Small cities, but state by themselves. Many mighty armies of the ancient world tried to conquer them, couldn't. Finally, Alexander the Great is the one who conquered them. And God often, if you read the book of uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, condemned these cities. Though they were full of wealth, Affluent, luxurious, full of trade and business, shipyards everywhere. Really, the ancient naval business was centered on Tyre and Sidon, especially in the Mediterranean world. And God condemned repeatedly through his prophets because of the wickedness. You know, love of money is the root of all evil. When the, when the city is full of money-minded people, they will welcome any kind of wickedness because they just want to make money. Whether it's prostitution or gambling or whatever, it doesn't matter. Bring money, bring money, that's all. And people get so wicked and they never repent. God sent prophets to preach against these cities. They didn't repent. So today, they're all destroyed. They are just ancient memories, that's all. We don't see these cities. And Jesus said to them, you remember there were two cities called Tyre and Sidon? If I have been to that, those cities and I did the miracle works that I have done in your midst, they would have long repented. But you didn't. And so verse 22, Jesus said, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable than Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. It looks like there will be varying punishments on the final day of judgment. We, those who are sinners and do not repent and believe on Jesus Christ will sure will go to that place of wrath, which is known as hell. But even in hell, it seems that there are varying punishments. People have asked me this question. Is it true that in hell there are many layers Upper level, lower level. Well, that's not in the Bible. I, I think that comes from some ancient religious thinking. Those levels are not mentioned in the Bible. But what is said in the Bible, Jesus himself says, there will be greater punishment for some. And I want to tell you something very clear. All of you, by the grace of God, have the privilege of hearing the gospel again and again with clarity can never plead before Christ that you didn't know it. 
So if you have known the gospel, you have known the truth, you heard the warning again and again, and still you repent, your punishment is much greater than you think. So said Jesus. And this is the doom he now compares and tells the world. Now you look into your heart. You who have come to Christ or come to hear him, you have been to the church, even the church called Gethsemane. You became a member here, but you still live like the world without repentance. You will have a greater judgment. And so, my dear friends, we must all the more fear the Lord. He's a great judge. Read the next verse, verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, he picks up another city in the northern Israel, and which art exalted unto heaven. That means the city was prospering. It was a proud city. So much to show forth. Wow! They look almost, they claim that they are heavenly city. And the Lord said, You are exalted unto heaven. Your pride has no limit. It just flies up to the sky. You shall be brought down to hell. Would Jesus say that? Would Jesus? Yes, he would. Because he's telling you the truth. If he doesn't tell you the truth, he is a liar. He must tell you, the higher you climb, the harder you fall. Now, just because God allows you to be rich, just because you have everything your heart desires, food, food, entertainment, big house, nice salary, everything, you have a comfortable life. And you say, God bless me. But wait a minute. Are there things in your life that God is displeased with? Are there sins that you are not repented from? Are there sins that you will never give up? Then Jesus says to you, without a doubt, and I say as his preacher to you, standing united with Christ, he will judge you. No matter what your pride would say to you, you will fall. And that's what the scripture says. You know, please don't take it as a threat. There's no threat. I'm nobody to threat threaten you. Who am I? But these are the voice. This is the voice of God's truth and judgment. It's good for us to hear. Lest we may take our life for granted. You know, it's terrible to sin and still live in pride as though nothing to repent from. It's horrible. We must come to church in tears. We must tremble in our heart when we come before his presence. When we sing, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, we better know what we are singing. He is holy. And you have no right to take his name in your tongue if you are unrepentant. Verse 24, I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. He already said that at the end of verse 23. Because if I have done the same work in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah? The, the two cities, the very ancient cities, that existed even before Tyre and Sidon, during the time of Abraham, where Lot went to live. What happened to that city? Fires came down from heaven. Brimstone destroyed it. And now Jesus says, Oh, oh, Capernaum, Sodom would have repented. But because you didn't repent, Capernaum, or some would pronounce Capernaum, your doom is worse than that of Sodom. We'll get some an ends. Let me ask you. I don't want ever you hearing this from Christ. I don't want to hear for myself. I don't want my wife and children to hear this. I don't want you, my dear brethren, after I preach to you, ever to hear this from the mouth of Christ, that your judgment will be worse. And I want to say, we who would not repent will have a much worse day of judgment than those who never heard. So we come to the concluding part. Verses 25 to 27. At that time, watch this. The glory of God is declared by Christ. The glory of God is the judge. He says to God, 
He turns to God after rebuking the people and he prays. This is a prayer of Christ. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Wow, it's shocking. It's shocking. Do you understand what Jesus just prayed with thanksgiving? He said, Father, I thank you for hiding this truth of condemnation from those who think that they are wise and prudent. You know what is this? This is what theologians call judicial hardening. God leave you to your sin and you will never see your sin. You act as though you never sin. Judgment already began in the house of God. You know, there is a situation where you become so proud and arrogant and you will not repent. You will not kneel before God and say, Lord, I have many sins. I'm a wicked man. You know me through and through. Have mercy. This is my sin. And oh, that is my sin. Oh, I have a bad mouth that talks wicked things. I use vulgarity. I curse people. This is bad. I cannot be like that. Oh Lord, I'm a man who doesn't even know how to talk. Have mercy. But you say, oh, he deserve it. <laughs> you think I will use vulgarity anyhow? He deserve it. I will say a few more. You want to know my vocabulary? Wow. You try to make yourself righteous for rebuking and cursing people. And some others will commit adultery. And then challenge the poor wife. Why? Shame on you. Because you are not a good wife. So if you tell others I committed adultery, it's a shame on you, not on me. I'm a great man. I have sexual power. Now I can talk about it. You, it's because of your failure. I, I come across such a man recently who bully his wife by saying it's a shame on her and that's why he committed adultery. You see, he justified himself. If any of you, including me, behave that way, your judgment is sealed. You have no more salvation. You are finished. And Jesus says, Father, I thank you for hiding these things from them because thou art a, thou art a just God. Wickedness must be punished. Yesterday, somebody asked me this question, Pastor, if my relatives do not repent and they decide to reject all gospel preaching and they don't repent from the sin, they don't believe in Jesus Christ and they go to hell, when I get to heaven, will I be sad? I said, no, you will never be sad. He said, well, but I feel very sad. I said, that sort of feeling is sinful. What you are feeling is a sinful love. Jesus already said, if you love your father or mother, brother or sister or wife more than me, you cannot be my disciple. You remember something. God never punishes an innocent person. He's a just God. But when God judges, whether it is me or my father or my son, well, after pleading with them, they still won't repent. It is what is rightfully theirs. Judgment. And at that time, we must say, turn to God and say, Thou art a good, holy, and just God. All glory to you. Jesus did that. He says to the Father, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Who are the babes? Those who are humble. They will follow instruction. They hold the parent's hand all the time. Help me, daddy. Help me, mommy. The father moves a little bit further. The baby will start crying. They are reliant on God. And you as a sinner, you trust in the Savior whom God sent and say, don't leave me, Lord. 
Where else can I go? Thou alone has salvation. Thou alone has eternal life. Thou alone can guide my stupid, foolish, wicked heart into righteousness. Stay with me, Lord. I will follow you. To them, God will reveal his truth. When was the last time you cried and wept over your sin? When was the last time you felt heartbroken and said, Lord, no, 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 pornography, wickedness, all kinds of things is afflicting me. It's shameful. And that I'm walking around like a righteous man. Oh, I'm a sinner. You may be a judge. Get down, kneel before God and cry before your judgment comes upon you. You may be a king. Repent. Unless you become like a child to believe what Jesus says, you have no salvation. Your doom has begun now. Why not you cry out now? Savior, you are a great God. You are a loving God. You told me the truth today. All glory be to you. Help me to be a baby. I may be sitting here thinking that if I accept Jesus, then I'm not very strong in my heart. I want to show I'm clever. I want to argue. My dear friend, stop arguing. It's the day of your salvation or it's the day of your judgment. Decide this day. I plead with you to trust in Jesus. Let us pray. Father, work in the hearts of everyone, including thy servant. We need our Savior, Jesus Christ, who promised to cleanse us from all our sins. And we are thankful that thou art faithful and just to forgive all our sins as we confess them. You desire our repentance, not our prideful walk on this earth. Help us, O Lord. Deliver us from our sins and our condemnation. With the thanksgiving, once again we sing praise to thee and call everyone to trust in your power to deliver. O oh Lord, let thy people be saved and rejoice in thy salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.